Well, this morning we are continuing our Christmas series called Travel Light. And the big idea behind the series is that we often make the holidays more complicated than they need to be by carrying with us baggage that God just never asked us to carry. And there are some things that we just need to let go of this holiday season, like our desire to accumulate stuff. We talked about that in week one. We are an overstuffed people. Our closets are full. Our garages are full. Our outbuildings are full. We are tearing them down and buying or building bigger ones because we've just got a lot of stuff. But here's the problem. The stuff that clutters our closets also ends up cluttering our hearts and our minds. It's something we got to learn to let go of. Last week, Brandon did a great job of reminding us to let go of distractions. And during the holiday season, there's a lot of temptation to be a Martha and and just always distracted with the details of the holiday. And, And we forget that Mary is the one who actually chose the better thing simply by resting and listening and sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, this morning, I'm going to talk to you about letting go of something we all have. We probably don't like to admit we have this. We may keep it hidden in our sock drawer. Ladies, it might be tucked into that zipper pocket of your purse. Guys, you might have one of these things hidden in your gun safe, but we all have one of these. This morning, I want to talk to you about letting go of our need for control. Letting go of our need for control. Now, if I, if I just say control freak or controller, most of us could probably easily identify at least someone in our lives who might fit in that category. We all know them and we say, oh, she's a controller or he's a controller. But I believe today the scripture will reveal to us that deep down on the inside of each of us is our own little control freak. Can somebody say Amen. Only half of you said amen. Some people don't believe me. Some people don't believe me, but we all have a control freak living on the inside of us. Uh, What happens at your house when someone can't find the TV remote control? We go crazy, right? We start going crazy when we can't find the TV remote. We start going crazy and everyone is a suspect. Right? We'll look at each other and say, hey, have you seen the remote? No, I thought you had the remote. No, I didn't have the remote. Get up. <laughs> right? You're sitting there. You're trying to watch Home Alone, whatever. And they're like, get up right now. Every, you don't tr- I trust no one until we find that remote. Why? Some of you are shaking your head. Yes, this is, this is a fight. So, some people put the, I mean, you're chaining up the remote to the coffee table. You're frisking people at Christmas dinner. It's just getting awkward because deep down on the inside of us, every one of us is our own little control freak. Now everybody say amen. So as we jump into God's word today, we're, we're going to have the opportunity to deal with this little controller that likes to uh, hide in each of our hearts. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. It says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed or engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and he'll be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And then in verse 34, as Mary is trying to process all this, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God. 
Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Verse 37, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, we are going to walk slowly through the biblical account of what we might call this immaculate conception of our Lord Jesus Christ. But as we do, it is important for us to realize that here 2,000 years later, you and I, we know the whole story. But at this point in Mary's life, she does not. I'm going to say that again. Here we are. We're on the back side of this. We know 2,000 years of history. We know the whole story. But Mary, right now in this moment, does not. And right here, Mary is most likely a teenage girl engaged to a man that she is excited to marry and build a life with. She has planned her wedding. She probably has the venue picked out. She probably has, you know, the colors picked out. She's dreamed of her honeymoon. She might have some names picked out for their children. It's perfectly natural to think that this young engaged girl has thought through all of these things. But out of nowhere, an angel shows up and tells her two things. Number one, he says, Mary, you are blessed. And number two, as a result of your blessing, Mary, every plan that she has for her own life is now in jeopardy. Again, we rejoice in the announcement of a virgin birth, a birth that would usher in the Son of God. But Mary, the Scripture says, was troubled At this announcement, the angel says, Mary, you're blessed, but Mary feels confused. He says, Mary, you are blessed, but Mary feels fearful. Mary, you're blessed, but she starts imagining the embarrassment. She she wonders if Joseph is going to reject her. She wonders if she will be falsely accused of being an immoral woman. What will her parents say? What will her friends think? In this one announcement, God has just shown up with a divine interruption of Mary's entire life and every sense of control that she's ever had is slipping through her fingers. And as I was reading This text this week, I thought, I wonder how many of us would allow God to interrupt our plans. I wonder how many of us would allow God to interrupt our dreams. Like, how would we react if if God said, "I, I want you to move to another state? If he said Florida this morning, I'm probably there. But, but what if he said, I want you to change jobs? Lord, don't you understand? I've been in this job for 20 years. I got a retirement. I got a, I got a pension. I've, I, I've got a maid here. God, don't, don't you understand? What if God said, hey, I want, you to, I want you to give away that car? But Lord, you don't understand. I worked for this car for a long time, and I got it fixed up, and I got it painted just the way I wanted. God, I, I got custom floor mats and custom seat covers, and I really like this car, and, and I won first place last year at the Crossroads Car Show. But God said, hey, I'd like you to give it away to someone. What what if God said, I want you to give up that habit? But Lord, it's been a part of me for so long. I don't know if I, how could I live without it. I want you to give it up. What if God said, I want you to end that relationship because it's toxic. I just wonder how many of us would be willing to give up control. I know the religious answer is that we would say, yes, Lord. But if we were to give it some thought this morning, there are probably already some things in our lives that we are wrestling with God about. We probably don't need an angelic visit this morning to remind us that that God has already given us some instructions that we have yet to obey. Why? Because we like control. We like it. I want to make my own decisions. I want to be the master of my own destiny. I want to be in charge of my life. 
God is about to take Mary on a detour in her life that will make her feel totally out of control. And friends, there is perhaps no greater struggle in the human heart than the battle for control. Where does our desire to control come from? I think it can come from a lot of places. How about fear? I think fear can often drive our need for control. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes, sometimes pride is at the root. It might be a lack of faith. It might be a desire to protect. I've been hurt once. I'm never going to be hurt again. Therefore, I'm going to control everyone and everything around me in order to protect myself. A desire for control can come from perfectionism. We want everything to be perfect in our lives. Therefore, let me do it my way. How many fight over loading the dishwasher? Come on. Being a controller can be devastating to the relationships around us, but it can also be quite destructive in our relationship with God. It sounds foolish to say that we think we know better for our lives than God does, and most of us probably wouldn't say that out loud, but we really don't have to. We just live like it. <laughs> Someone say, ouch. The angel says, Mary, you're blessed. <laughs> and you're so blessed that God is actually taking control from your hands and is going to use you for his glory. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? I, I really feel for Mary here as she asked this question. And to be fair to Mary, this is a fair question. God, how... How can I have a baby when I, I've not known a man? I don't have a husband. It's a fair question, but it's also kind of a funny question because here we have this peasant teenage girl asking the God of the universe how he's going to do something. An angel has shown up and, and, and he's made this announcement and this teenage girl looks into the eyes of an angel and says, hey, I would like an explanation. I, <laughs> how often do we do that with God? <laughs> he tells us to do something. He tells us to go this way. Don't go that way. And, and we were like, hey, Lord, uh, before I obey, I'd like an explanation. Again, we don't say these things out loud, but we live them. We often think our plan is better than his. And if that wasn't true, then we wouldn't continually find ourselves in wrestling matches with God. You see, when we overestimate our ability to control, we underestimate the power of God. We'll say that again. When we overestimate our ability to control, we underestimate the power of God. That's why it's so important during this holiday season as we take another look at the first Christmas to remind ourselves of this powerful truth. He is God and we are not. We don't have the capacity to control everything and everyone. We don't have the responsibility to control everything and everyone. We are the creation. He is the creator. We are his sheep. He is our shepherd. We are his children. He is our father. We are the saved. He is the savior. Some of us just need to lay down our need for control today at the foot of the cross and thank God that we live in the very palm of his hand. He can be trusted. Mary's blessed, but right now as control slips from her fingertips, she does not feel blessed. And I just want to say this, that sometimes God's blessings do not feel like blessings at the moment. Sometimes they don't. Mary's blessing is about to walk her in. She's going to be accompanied by a blessing into one of the hardest seasons of her life. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It's happened to me. A blessing of God has grabbed me by the hand and pulled me into a season I did not want to go into. See, just because you're blessed 
doesn't mean it's easy. Just because you're blessed doesn't mean there'll be no resistance. Just because you're blessed doesn't mean there's not going to be any fear, any anxiety, any, any uh, turmoil going on inside of you. you. You might have to do some stuff while you're afraid. Her blessing is about to accompany her into one of the most difficult seasons of her life. But through this season, God in his sovereignty is about to save the world. (laughs) Praise God. And just as Mary did not know her whole story at this moment right now, you and I don't know ours either. Right now, God knows your whole story. You don't. Right now, God knows the next chapter of my life, and I do not. And if I'd be honest with you this morning, I would say that scares me. I don't like it. I want to know. Not just the next step. I want to know the next 20 steps. I want to know the next chapter. I want to know how the book ends. I want to know what's on the back cover. Are there any other control freaks in the house this morning? God says, Mary, I've blessed you. Now I'm going to walk you into a season that you'll have no control over. And I just want to encourage someone this morning who might be discouraged. Our good Father God is not done with you. Our good Father God still has a plan for your life. And even if you're in a difficult season, it is not the end of His plan. But it might be part of it. And I'm not saying that God causes every difficulty in our lives, but He will take them and weave them into our story. And I just want to tell someone this morning, you're only confused because you're still in chapter 1, but there is more to your story. And I'm not trying to just hype you up with some empty words this morning, but the reason I'm so confident of this is because I'm standing on a testimony. And I'm looking into the eyes of hundreds of people who have a testimony. You stand on your testimony. You live on your testimony. We serve a God that does not have a track record of failure. But today he rules and reigns from a place of repeated victory. Our God is too good to not believe. He has never ever lost a battle. Is there anyone in the room this morning that can look back on your life and you've got a testimony of the faithfulness of God? Come on, encourage someone around you. Give him praise so they know that they're not alone. Sometimes when you're in the midst of it, it's scary. You don't know what's happening next. Verse 38, Mary comes to a conclusion. Mary says, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. I love that. I love that. I love that. A few verses earlier, she was looking into the eyes of an angel and saying, how can this be? How's God going to do this thing? Verse 38, she says, Behold, I'm a maid servant of the Lord. You know what she's doing? She's reminding herself that she isn't God. She's reminding herself that she is simply his servant. And then she says this. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five words that change the world. Let it be to me. Let it be to me. Angel, you're a spokesman of God. What you have just said, God is going to do in my life, even though I can't comprehend it, even though I don't understand it, even though it's going to cost me some stuff, even though I'm going to be accused from some, uh, for some things, even though I'm going to be shunned maybe by my family and my friends. Lord, in spite of all of that, let it be to me. According to your word, and the angel departed from her. Can I tell you this morning that the greatest sense of deep peace and true satisfaction in any of our lives will only come when we willingly say, let it be. Lord, let your will be in me. The greatest sense of completeness in our lives is when we live Surrendered. Mary surrenders her will and God changes 
the world. She surrenders. She carries the Son of God. She gives birth to Jesus. And this week, here we are celebrating something we call Christmas, Christ Mass, the first coming of Jesus Christ, because a teenage girl surrendered. Now, over the years, I've pondered this question. Could Mary have refused? Could Mary have said, no thanks. <laughs> I'm not interested. Perhaps, the Lord, you could choose someone else. I have a friend. Could, could she have said no to God? Well, <laughs> for thousands of years, theologians have debated the idea of man's free will versus God's sovereignty. And I, I don't know, a lot of people much smarter than me have debated this for a long time, so I can't give you a definitive answer whether Mary could have said no to God or not. But here's what I do know. It's a dumb idea to say no to God. It's a really bad idea to play tug-of-war with God. Remember a guy named Jonah? Jonah? He didn't want to obey God at first, and he ended up in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, and then Jonah surrendered. How about a guy by the name of Saul who was, who was in opposition to Jesus' plan for his life? He's actually persecuting the church when he's called to be a preacher. Instead, he's a persecutor, and he's called to be an apostle. Instead, he's a terrorist, and, and Jesus shows up on that road to Damascus in this form of a bright light and knocks him off his horse, and he goes blind for three days, and then he surrendered. It's a dumb idea to play tug-of-war with God. Can you say amen? Can you win that war? I think the better question is, is why would we want to? Right? Why would we want to? Can I tell you this morning that often the thing that stands between us and our God-given purpose is simply surrender. Can you imagine that? I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm literally not oversimplifying the purpose of God for our lives. Every one of us in this place God has a purpose for our lives. And often the thing that stands between us and the entire reason God gave us breath and put us on this planet, often the only thing that stands between us and that destiny is surrender. Friends, the level of success in our lives. And when I'm talking about success, I'm talking about true peace. I'm talking about real joy. I'm talking about contentment. I'm talking about satisfaction. The level of success in our lives is in direct correlation to our level of surrender, not control. Do you know that God can do more with your surrender than you can do with your control? God can do more with my surrender than he can with my control. Do you know what Mary does at the end of this chapter? It's, it's pretty amazing to me. You know what she does at the end of this chapter? She writes a song. That's what she does. She writes a song of praise. I want you to look at, look at it with me. Look at verse 46. Mary, she's concluding everything that we just walked through here with her. She's concluding this chapter, and, and look what happens. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. This is a song she's writing. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Remember, earlier she was troubled. 
Now she's starting to embrace as she surrenders to God. She's starting to embrace, hey, this is actually a blessing. This difficult season in my life is actually a blessing. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He's put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary surrenders her need for control, and then she reminds herself of the bigness of her God. by giving him praise. Over the years, I'm trying more and more to follow Mary's example. And when I get weighed down by the things that are beyond my control, I got to remind myself just how big God is by magnifying him through praise. Just this week, I'm I'm just driving and I'm, I'm, I'm I'm being consumed with the cares of this life. And and I didn't know what else to do. So I just start speaking out loud the praise of God. Lord, I love you. God, you're good. Lord, you're faithful. God, I can trust you with the things that I cannot control. And as the words of my mouth, the fruit of my lips are coming out in my car. Do you know what starts to happen? His peace starts to fill the car. That's the power of praise. And we've got some people listening this morning who are just weighed down with the heaviness of depression today. And and friend, I'm not minimizing your pain or your sorrow, but I am telling you that sometimes you have to trade in the spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise. You, you, You might have to do that. You might have to get along with God and start magnifying him instead of your problems. And you might say, well, pastor, I'm not comfortable doing that. With all due respect, I'm not concerned with your comfort. I'm concerned with your victory. You might say, pastor, it's just not my personality to be loud and demonstrative with my praise. Well, it's not mine either. But praise is an act of our will. It's not a product of our personality. Do you understand that? That worship is not based upon who I am or based upon who you are. Worship is based upon who God is and God is worthy. You don't need a new personality. Sometimes you just need a new perspective. You got to praise him in the midst of that thing. In this series, we've been talking about letting go of things because the things that we hold on to are deceptive. They deceive us. Remember that the the man who was tearing down his small barn to build a bigger barn to put all of his stuff in. He says, once I get that bigger barn, then then everything's going to be okay with my soul. His possessions had lied to him. Martha last week, she she thought her contentment and her satisfaction was actually chasing distraction. What she needed to do was fix her eyes on Jesus. In our need for control, is very, very deceiving. Patty and I got married young, and for 10 years we just had one child. We were trios, just Dave and Patty and little Dave, what we called him at the time. And back in the day, little Dave and I would sometimes play video games together. So we would have our controller, I'd have a controller, he'd have a controller, be playing wrestling, dad's winning. But then we had another son, Matthew. And as Matthew started getting a little older, he wanted to play. But the game was only two player. Now listen, I can tell by the look on some of your face right now, you're going to judge me hard for this. But we would take a third controller and we would give it to Matthew. And he would sit there and he would play with us. But the thing is, is his controller, it wasn't plugged into nothing. And he didn't know it. Now I see my son with his sons, he's got four little boys. And sometimes I'll walk down in the family room and I'll see a little boy sitting there with a controller in his hand and it ain't plugged into nothing. And he don't know it. Here's the deception, friends. There's actually 
very little in this world that you and I can control. But when we have this thing in our hand, we feel like we are somebody. We feel like we're calling the shots. We feel like we're, we're something. And God's saying, I'm the sovereign God of the universe. And Dave, you simply have a controller not plugged in. God can do way more with our surrender than he can our control. Would you stand with me today? Mary said, let it be unto me. Mary's let it be unto me is very similar to what Jesus said in the garden. When he's struggling, because he knows he's got to go to the cross, what did Jesus say? He finally gets to the end of that prayer time, and he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's the same thing. Different words, but it's the same thing. What say you? What say me? Are we living surrendered lives? I'm not preaching at you today. I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone in the room. When God tells us to do something, are we doing it? Have we said yes to Him? It's not a one-time decision. It's a daily decision. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. What was he talking about? He wasn't talking about having a funeral every day. He's talking about his will, his own pride, his own fear, his own desire for control. He died to that every single day. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you acknowledging that each of us has a struggle with our will. Our will can be selfish. Our will can be stubborn. Our will can make us wrestle with you for control. Today, Lord, we're asking you to take the truths contained in your word and apply them to our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us, God, to trust you and not in ourselves. Help us to submit to you knowing that your plan is so much better than ours. Your ways are so much higher than ours. And church, if God has been talking to you about an area of your life that you're holding on to that control, perhaps today can be your day to surrender. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ... I have found over the years that one of the biggest barriers to a person being born again, becoming a follower of Christ, is that desire for control. Today, if you never surrendered your life to him and said yes to Jesus, this is your day. I can think of no better way to go into this Christmas week than surrendering to him. When Jesus said yes in that garden, when he surrendered his will to go to the cross, he went to that cross for me and you. Every one of us has a need for a savior in our lives because we were born sinners. The best of us was born a sinner. Jesus died for you. He died for me. If you never said yes to him, Today, would you say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to cleanse me of my past. I want to know you, Lord. I want to serve you with my life. Make me born again today. Friend, if you're reaching out to him, one of us, we would love to talk to you. I'll be hanging around after service. I'd love to talk to you. We have people out at our welcome counter. They'd love to talk to you, welcome you to the family of God, tell you what some next steps are. 
Praying a prayer like that is not all there is to knowing God. It's just that first step. Father, we thank you that you're good and you're sovereign. You can be trusted. Lord God, we do pray for this week that lies ahead. As we know, hundreds and hundreds of people are going to walk through these doors. God, we pray that you would lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. That you would prepare our hearts. That you would prepare this church. Father, as we prepare to make you room. God, you would come into this place and do what only you can do. God, that you would save souls and build your family. Does anyone believe that God's able to save someone this weekend, this this week that's coming, in these services, that God is able to reach down and redeem people? That's what I'm praying for. Pray with us this week that God will just do an incredible work here and draw many into his family. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen.